Thank you. Um, I'm Caitlin Houghton. I'd like to thank Sages. Uh, it's such an honor to be a part of this uh, panel, so thank you. Um, I'm talking about wireless pH studies and impedance studies, when and how to use them. These are my disclosures. So the objectives of the talk today are to discuss the types of pH testing, highlight the advantages and disadvantages, discuss potential pitfalls, and propose the best practice, um, best practice for clinical applications. Prior to pH monitoring, GERD was based on endoscopic findings alone. pH monitoring became available at, at for testing in the 1970s, actually. It was uh, initially, um, there was initial uh, technology in the 1960s, but really for testing in the 1970s, which really allowed the surgeon or the, um, or our, the doctor to understand and quantify pH for the first time. There are several types of pH monitoring. You can do 24-hour pH catheter, wireless pH Bravo, um, combined multiple interluminal impedance, and we're going to go through all of three of these today. So a little bit of history. Mid-1960s was the first time that telemetric intragastric pH recordings were introduced, and this was reported uh, with a Heidelberg capsule. In 1969, Spencer published the first report on prolonged intraesophageal pH monitoring. In the mid-1970s, Johnson and Demeester established the first normal values against which we could diagnose GERD patients. In 1991, Silney first described multi-channel intraluminal impedance. And in 2003, the Bravo system uh, became available, allowing us to do wireless pH testing. So there are several sites for the catheter and monitoring. Um, and this is using the uh, pH a catheter probe. So if a single monitoring site is placed at five centimeters above the LES, and this is placed with manometric uh, findings to guide our placement. We have multiple monitoring sites. We can place a probe at five and 15 centimeters above the LES, and this is really used for patients when they're symptomatic, um, off PPIs to look at the extent, or try and look at the extent of reflux. Or you can have one in the esophagus and one in the proximal stomach, and people are using that for um, symptom, symptomatic patients on PPIs to make sure that your PPI therapy is changing the intragastric acidity appropriately. So what are the indications for pH monitoring? Um, a normal EGD and reflux symptoms refractory to PPI. EGD negative patient before an anti-reflux surgery. Patients suspected to have abnormal reflux after surgery. Uh, refractory reflux in patients with chest pain after a negative cardiac evaluation. Suspected ENT manifestations after failure of greater than four weeks of PPI therapy. And GERD in the adult onset non-allergic asthma. So the first study is the pH probe. Uh, this is an indwelling catheter, goes transnasally. It's placed five millimeters above the LES, um, guided by manometric measurement. The sensitivity and specificity of this test is about 70%, and that's for patients that have no um, mucosal injury uh, on the endoscopy, and the specificity is up to 100%. If they do have mucosal changes, that sensitivity does go up. So the diagnosis for GERD based on these findings is the percent time of pH of below 4, uh, greater than 4.3% of the time, and a Demeester score of greater than 17.72, or 14, did I say that right? 14.72. Um, side effects are nasal and pharyngeal discomfort, rhinorrhea, uh, patients with uh, decreased activity. So when, with this probe in your, in your nose, likely patients, most patients aren't going to go around doing their normal daily activities like we'd like them to. Uh, they might sit, stay at home, they may lay low, and that can result in some false negative testing um, and decreased reflux during that 24 per hour period. Next is the Bravo pH monitor system. So this now becomes wireless, which is allowing for better patient comfort and an increased duration of testing. Up, uh, we usually test for 48 and all the way up to 96 hours. This is usually done off PPIs, which are suspended for seven days prior to the testing. 
And the, the um, probe or the uh, Bravo is placed six centimeters above the Z line, and this is placed uh, based on endoscopic measurement. And then we diagnose GERD with a pH time above 5.3% and a Demeester score greater than 14.72. During the testing period, the patient is wearing a wires, uh, wireless recorder. It's uh, on a shoulder strap or sometimes a wristband, and they are tracking their symptoms throughout the whole testing period. So you're gonna have buttons to press for chest pain and cough or regurgitation and heartburn, and they're also gonna record a diary of all of their meals when they're supine, when they're laying down, taking a nap and for overnight. Um, we're going to collect all of that information uh, and analyze it, and then the capsule will be released, um, or it'll slough off in five to seven days and be excreted. So the advantages of the pH monitor are improved patient comfort, a fixed placement of the pH electrode, um, so there's no risk of it slipping during the testing period into the stomach. You can have prolonged recording because of the patient comfort. Um, disadvantages, higher cost of the pH capsule, uh, need for endoscopy for accurate, accurate placement, which may also increase the cost, or repeat a study that's already been done by your GI colleagues. Um, risk of data loss during the wireless transmitting process, so if the patient's out of range of the transmitter for part, part of your uh, uh, study time, or if it can also um, be disengaged uh, too early, and that can happen about 10% of the time. So what are we looking at when once we get our pH data, what are we really looking at and what do we need to determine acid reflux in our patients? Well, a Demi the Demeester score is one of those uh, guiding factors. It's greater than 14.72. Uh, it will be abnormal. Um, and it's really a accumulation of six data points. The total percent time of pH less than four, and then the pH time less than four in both the supine and upright position. Total number of reflux episodes, total number of reflux episodes that are greater than five minutes, and then the longest reflux episode. All of those data points are then going to be um, placed, put into the score uh, to determine your Demeester score. So this is what your tracing is going to look like. Um, you can see there's a blue line at the, uh, towards the bottom of the tracing, and that's your uh, pH of four. Uh, just to note that that value is because pepsin is uh, triggered at the pH of four, and you're more likely to get mucosal injury if your pH is below that level, and therefore anything below that level is considered reflux. So your data points, what are, you, what are we getting from this? You're going to get a log of your data points, and it's going to outline all of the things um, that we use for the Demeester score, as, as well as giving you their Demeester score. In this patient, it's 33. And you can see you get the percent time it total, upright, uh, supine. So we can look at all of those data points individually as well. So um, sensitivity of Bravo testing, uh, if you use 24-hour day, one-day testing, it's about 74% with a specificity of about 90%. Using worst day, so we're gonna, they're going to plot out multiple days during your study. Um, if you use the worst day, then your sensitivity will go up to 100%, but you're going to decrease your specificity a little to about 85. And if you're going to use the total testing period of 48 hours or 96 hours, then you're going to have a similar sensitivity and specificity as the worst day data. This is what that's going to look like. So in this patient, on day one, uh, both days, the patient is diagnosed with uh, acid reflux. Um, but day one, it's a little more moderate, and it's variable. And you've got to know that um, this reflux does vary from day to day based on patient factors, activities. And so you may have one day that's normal and two days that are abnormal. Um, and you need to look at that closely. So um, you can see there's variability, variability. one day. Um, she has a Demeester score of 88.5. Uh, day one was 33.8. 30, this is one of the pitfalls. You really have to look at your tracings, because you can get false data if you just go by the Demeester score, and you're like, great, it was 100. Well, that's really high, for one. Maybe it is. Um, but you've got to look at your tracing. And as you can see, that cluster of red lines below uh, four uh, pH is actually the probe fell off prematurely. 
is now in the stomach, and then as you see that, that uh, line go back up to about nine, that's when it's into the duo. So look at your tracing, make sure that your data makes sense. So combined multi-channel interluminal impedance testing. The pH monitoring for this is no different than the catheter-based pH monitoring for as far as the patient goes. You still have an intranasal catheter and you're measuring at five centimeters above the LES. Um, but we, there is a change in the testing paradigm now because this will allow us to not only check, um, not be so dependent about um, the pH level, we're going to be able to look at non-acid reflux, reflux, weakly acidic reflux, and we're going to be able to determine whether that's a liquid, gas, or a mixed uh, reflux state. Um, and we're measuring by alternating electric currents between two electrodes that are spaced about two centimeters apart along the entire, um, multiple testing points along the catheter. So I think about it, what is impedance? Um, I think about it actually as, uh, in terms of conductivity, because it's actually the opposite of conductivity, and that just seems more logical to me. Um, so fluid is going to have a high conductance or high conductivity and therefore a low impedance. Air is going to have low conductivity but high impedance. So it's the opposite. And we'll see that um, in a second on a tracing, what that looks like. So it will detect reflux independent of pH. Like I said, acid reflux, non-acidic, determines the content, liquid, mixed, or gas, and it can show the proximal extent of your reflux. On a tracing, uh, you can see that dip of the line is liquid refluxate. That's low impedance. So you're going to see a dip in your line uh, at indicating a reflux. And then if you look on the bottom panel, you'll see that there's a correlation in the first column with a dip of the pH below 4. However, in the second column, you have a similar looking reflux, but there's no dip in the pH, so that's non-acidic reflux. So. Uh, Multi-lumen impedance testing is a preferred method of testing for patients with persistent symptoms on PPI therapy. And this is going to clarify if the symptoms are associated with acidic, non-acidic, or with not associated to reflux at all. We're going to use less than 48 as the normal value, so anything above 48 reflux episodes is going to be considered abnormal for patients who are suppressed, so on PPI therapy. It's also a preferred method for testing for extraesophageal symptoms like chronic cough. So there, this study is showing taking 144 patients with ongoing symptoms despite maximal PPI therapy. And there's a symptom association score. I'm going to get into that a little bit long, uh, later in the talk. But using the symptom association scores, this study was able to show that 37 patients, 30 percent, 7 percent of patients were actually non-acidic reflux. 11 percent were due to acid reflux. And there was no association in 52 percent of patients. What this really is telling us is that 37 percent of patients had non-acidic reflux, and it could have been missed on a pH test alone. It's also the preferred method of testing for extraesophageal symptoms like chronic cough. There's two papers I'm going to talk about. One had 28 patients with chronic cough. Um, they're tested on PPI therapy. Uh, Ten patients had symptom association, um, five of them acidic, five of them non-acidic. Again, we would have missed those patients. 50% and then a second paper confirming that, 50 patients with chronic cough despite PPI therapy, 13 patients with high association of symptoms between reflux and cough. And most of those were non-acidic as well. So what are the disadvantages? Um, Barrett's esophagus is one of the disadvantages, because Barrett's is going to create a low impedance environment and therefore make it very difficult to uh, see uh, liquid refluxate on the tracing itself. So it's difficult in those patients. Also, there are some inaccuracies of the automated analysis software. So the data really requires manual data correction, which can be cumbersome and time consuming. Here are the symptom correlations. So it's one thing to say, OK, our patient has reflux disease. We've shown that they have um, decreased pH. Um, but we really want to know, well, it's a what's the causation? Is it causing the symptoms that we're trying to fix? Um, there's two scores that try and do that that we're going to get uh, during our data collection. The symptom index, which this is the percent symptoms preceded by a drop in pH below 4 within the last five minutes. This, therefore, 
restate that, uh, number of reflux episodes associated with symptoms divided by the total number of symptom episodes. And this is done in categories for each symptom. So regurgitation will have a separate score to heartburn and cough. Um, an SI above 50% is a positive association. So it does have some limitations. The score does not take into account the total number of reflux episodes, and false positives can be common. Because if you have a lot of reflux, you have a lot of reflux episodes, you could get random pushing, uh, randomly push the button at the right time to get a high association score, because there's so much reflux at the time. Um, and it's also dependent on the completeness of the patient log, because we're really looking at their subjective data to make these associations. The second one is the symptom association probability. This is used as a Fisher's exact test to calculate the probability that symptoms didn't occur by chance alone. This is a statistical score. Um, greater than 95% shows association. Um, and this is similar to your p-test. So this is what that looks like. You'll see at the bottom um, the symptom association summary. Each Symptom, heartburn, chest pain, regurgitation has their own scores. This patient um, has a good SAP in both heartburn and regurgitation. The heartburn didn't quite make the SI index, um, but we know that there are some limitations with that, so I would say that I would be comfortable offering this patient an anti-reflux surgery. So pH testing, Bravo versus impedance. pH testing or wireless pH testing should be do done off PPI. It increase, you can increase the duration of your testing. We frequently are doing 96 hours now to make sure we don't miss patients that have reflux. Uh, patients are more likely to resume normal daily activities, uh, lessening the false uh, negative rate, and detection is dependent on, but detection is dependent on pH alone. Impedance is done on or off PPIs. You can uh, look at non-acid and non-acid reflux. You can look at the extent of reflux, and it can characterize the refluxate material. So clinical applications, um, pH monitoring off PPI can quantify reflux prior to surgical intervention. I would use it frequently in almost all patients that are going to have a surgical intervention unless they have C or D esophagitis. You could argue that you don't need it in those patients. However. On the contrary, you also sometimes will want a baseline in order to, if some, they have persistent symptoms and you want to make sure that your surgery did what you went, set out to do, sometimes I like to get a baseline regardless of esophagitis, which may be controversial. Um, you can prove diagnosis in patients with no reflux esophagitis, but with typical symptoms. When is impedance the better first choice? Well, to determine an association of persistent symptoms despite PPI therapy, or to evaluate proximal extent of the reflux, um, which may help with laryngeal extraesophageal symptoms. Look at your data, uh, make sure that the tracings make sense, um, avoid those pitfalls of early detachment of the Bravo probe, slippage of your pH catheter into the stomach, or a low impedance background making it difficult to capture reflux on impedance study. Um, you'll want to look at the presence of reflux. Um, oh, and the presence of reflux does not prove causality of symptoms, so look at the association scores, but know that there are limitations. It's nice to see that there is some symptom correlation. Thank you.